So what I will do, I had planned a talk that is very much related to the AI Act uh, and my uh, interest uh, with regards to, um, to this. Uh, but what I will try to do is maybe move more quickly on that. So we have more time for questions and answer. And then uh, I'm not talking here about the um, specific projects in which we are working, instead focusing on one particular topic that I'm very interested in, and I wanted to get people's feedback on today. Here are, I believe Christopher and others are experts on the AI Act and, and regulator regulation uh, coming out. So I thought that uh, that will be quite important. Now, these are two paintings uh, that I have in, in my office, Las Meninas, uh, that you might have seen. Uh, the original uh, was uh, painted in the 1600s. And then there's one by Picasso. Um, what is, was very innovative, and apparently this is one of the most discussed paintings in history. And the one innovation he had is that the painter, Velasquez, uh, painted himself in there. Uh, and then Picasso painted himself or Velasquez uh, behind there. Uh, the quality is not very good, but it, it's to me, it's a very good reminder about the way we materialize in the things that we create and how it is important to reflect, especially for engineers like myself, to reflect how our values and our perspectives have an impact on the type of things we do and how we approach those problems. So I've, uh, lately I've been finding some value and telling people a little bit about where I'm coming from so you can understand why maybe I choose particular topics. Um, so in, in my personal case, my family was exiled from Argentina in the 70s when there was a, a stream right dictatorship, if you want, uh, the junta. Uh, there were many people uh, who disappeared. Uh, and my parents uh, went to Venezuela to live in Venezuela. Um, on the other hand, my wife's family, roughly at the same time, had to escape communism from Cuba and they escaped to uh, the US. So two extremes of the political spectrum end up in somewhat similar uh, situations, right? And what is interesting that in both cases, they were not necessarily escaping, escaping physical harm. They were escaping psychological harm in a, in a way. Of course, there was a danger to physical harm as well, but sometimes it's people, people seeking autonomy. That was what for many families back then, it was key. That was a time of the Cold War, supposedly Cold War, uh, that it wasn't so cold in Latin America. No? Uh, it was something that affected many families um, and, and it's multi-generational in a way. So what motivates me to do research? Well, the, the motto, if you want, of the lab has been for like a decade is that all technologies should be designed to support well-being. I say decade, but I moved to Imperial College in 2019 from the University of Sydney. And in the University of Sydney, we had the same the same name even, um, the lab, obviously changed some of the people, but otherwise it was very similar. And the mission for the lab is to develop <laughs> models, methods, and a body of evidence, generally this is empirical research, on how to design for well-being. So on the models, I'm going to be telling you a little bit about the model uh, and how it may connect to regulatory approaches, uh, for example, in the AI Act and others. Then methods, so we develop methods for designers on how to introduce or take into account um, evidence from psychology on how to design for well-being. And then we actually build, I mean, an engineer, we actually build and test and evaluate interventions, generally health and mental health interventions. And I'm happy to talk about some of these later on in the discussion. I will, like I said, I will try to move more quickly and then uh, give time for questions, but interrupt me if you want, right? So design engineering is a concept that, uh, or a discipline, if you want, that is very British in a way. I haven't really heard the, the, the term until I became professor of design engineering. That's quite funny, but design engineering combines 
engineering and the different engineering disciplines like electronic engineering, software engineering. At the University of Sydney, I was professor of software engineer. Um, so I, from this background, but then we introduced design methods, design psychology, uh, elements from human computer interaction, and then business perspectives about how to make these things sustainable. Uh, and for many years before uh, coming to Imperial, I work on effective computing. So some of you will know what this is, uh, basically refers of a sub discipline, uh, looking into how to recognize emotions. Uh, and we can do it that from facial expressions, from language, from the tone of voice, uh, from many multiple type of signals, even physiological signals. Uh, and I added the, the, the handbook there. One of the most cited papers I have is um, a literature review I wrote like 10, 15 years ago. Um, and I started in the same way that everybody in effective computing started. Now in the introduction, I had a, this paragraph there. The basic tenet behind most effective computing systems is that automatically recognizing and responding to users' effective states during interactions with the computer can enhance the quality of the interaction thereby making a computer interface more usable, enjoyable, and effective. So this motivation for the work on effective computing is common to the whole discipline. Um, but over the years, I realized that there were two words in there that I hadn't really thought about. You know, when you write an introduction and you don't pay that much attention to every single word. The first one is, what is the quality? is the quality is a degree of excellence of something and effective, it means successful in producing a desired or intended result. But for whom? That's the key question. It's an ethical value. It's excellence of something. What is the measure of excellence? Who is it good for? Um, who defines the word effective? No, what does it mean to be effective? For a computational person, that could be minimizing an error function. From the values perspective could be the economic benefit to the company who implements this in their uh, platform. For the direct stakeholders, the people that directly interact with the system, it could be the benefits that it gives them to access new functionality, et cetera, or potentially even have uh, a more usable interaction with a computer but there are many different value, meanings of value there. Um, so that led me uh, quite a few years ago to start thinking more, more, more about ethics. Um, like other researchers um, in the field, I have found that the biomedical ethics framework um, is particularly useful. Floridi, for example, review something like 120, um, sets of principles in the AI literature, AI ethics literature, and he also, or his team, came up with these basically four principles. Most of my lab has focused generally on well-being and human autonomy, and that's what I'm going to be talking a lot about today. But more recently, I've been interested in doing no harm, particularly because this is connected to the AI Act and a lot of things that are coming uh, with other legislatory approaches, regulatory approaches to AI. So before moving to that, what is well-being is particularly important in a research lab who, uh, whose motto ethos is all about designing for well-being. So we wrote a book called Positive Computing and all technologies should be designed to support psychological well-being. It's at the core of this work. Uh, and in the book, we review uh, literature on, on well-being coming from economics, from uh, design psychology, from human computer interaction, from uh, many philosophy, obviously. But what we have found particularly useful is uh, this theory, a motivation theory called self-determination theory. That, uh, if there are psychologists here, we'll have, you will have heard of them. Uh, and I was lucky enough to work with Richard Ryan and Ed Desi, who were the creators in the 70s. And the theory uh, basically posits that there are three basic psychological needs that we all need to fulfill in order to do well. 
even to engage with a behavior, we need to feel a sense of competence. That means feeling able and effective when I do something. If I don't feel effective, um, if I'm not feeling capable of doing something, for example, giving a lecture, I'm not going to be enjoying it. I'm going to be nervous, stressed. I will escape as often as possible. Uh, if I don't uh, um, feel effective about work, walking 10,000 steps, you know, the standard um, exercise thing, I'm not going to do it because, you know, if I, my body can't do it, uh, if I just give up ahead of time, right? I disengage. So competence is one psychological need. Relatedness is also core. It's about feeling a meaningful connection to others. When I feel connected to you, I am much more likely to have a valuable conversation. I am much more likely to uh, feel part of a community. Uh, and this is really important, uh, especially for technology designers. We want to create community. We want to create uh, an environment where people feel meaningful connections to others. And this is obviously not the same as Facebook friends, right? We want meaningful connections. It's important to emphasize that. And finally, autonomy. This is the feeling of willingness and volition in action. This is also really important. I'm going to be talking a lot about that now. So again, as a designer, this is very important. Designers create environments where we live uh, and we, these environments can support or hinder well-being. So I can ask how does effective computing or any intelligent system help create the environments that support the psychological needs. So the first one, competence, refers to growth and mastery. And normally when we do user research, if uh, technology is frustrating people's need for competence, they will say things like this. It's way too complicated, forget it. This is a bit overwhelming. I guess I'm too stupid to figure this out. When people are telling me these sort of things, um, I, they disengage, right? They don't want to use the technology. And we have addressed this sometimes by, uh, in the e-learning context. So in another volume, uh, we looked into uh, things like how emotions can be a driver for learning, for motivation towards learning, how emotions, um, the different types of emotions that people feel when they engage on learning uh, activities, etc. The next one is relatedness as a way of supporting user experience. So these are the type of statements that I will hear when people feel the technology supporting them. I feel part of a community. It helps me still connected to people that are important to me. I feel like I'm not in this alone. It feels good to help others. And I emphasize in feels there because what we are looking is always at the phenomenology of these things. It's how it's people's experiences of uh, the interaction with the technology. So here's one example where we uh, develop a platform for helping medical students uh, learn communication skills. So uh, normally when you're a medical student, you will have a sessions, practice sessions with simulated patients. So one of these is a simulated patient, the other one is the doctor, um, and they have the conversation and then we can pick up a lot of signals uh, to this. Uh, that highlight when the patient is feeling connected, is feeling rapport, et cetera. And this has to do with nonverbal expressions, uh, mimicry behaviors, with tone of voice, et cetera. Then we have autonomy. And this one to me is very important because technology has a huge impact on this one as well. But in, my, in the literature on human computer interaction, autonomy has been very ill-defined. And this is also the one that regulators are constantly aiming for. They constantly talk about how do we regulate to support the sense of autonomy from um, citizens and so on. So autonomy for us is endorsement, the willingness to engage in a behavior. It doesn't mean that there are no rules. No, what, what it means is that I'm willingly engaging in that. For example, when I stop in a red light, 
a pedestrian light or, or in, the, in a car, I do it because I know that it's unsafe to cross. It's, I don't feel generally a sense of frustration because somebody told me stop, right? I understand uh, why I'm doing it. So it's really important when people's behaviors are limited, for example, with censorship or limiting um, the freedom of expression for people to understand why they do it. In some of the work we did with, around COVID was about that. People needed to understand the motivation, the rationale for why we couldn't do certain things. If they didn't, the situations backfire. Sometimes we also delegate um, decision-making to others. You know? When we get older, um, we're doing a lot of work on dementia. It's very common, well, it's a necessity of the illness that the person with dementia has to depend on the carer, right? Because that's the nature of things. And the person that is, sees that dementia is coming has to cede autonomy to the other person. No? And that's not necessarily, well, it's not nice, but when the person understands and takes, uh, uh, accepts the situation, uh, then that supports their well being. So when autonomy is frustrated, this is the type of things we hear. It won't do what I want it to do. It doesn't fit my situation. It's too restrictive, et cetera. But this sometimes is not, well, I have a couple of examples here. One is notification settings. So in, on our mobile phone, we feel more autonomy because uh, the phone with the notifications because then the phone allows to configure that type of thing. See, if we didn't, we will feel constantly invaded by all this noise, right? In fact, if you go to the well-being uh, initiative from Google, you will see that it's all about autonomy. It's like people, uh, uh, Google themselves say, the reason that people complain about the well-being uh, impact of technologies is because of their sense of autonomy. We feel control. So that's the sort of things that they try to address. So frustration comes of interventions, designs that feel controlling, manipulative, intrusive, nagging, inflexible, surveillance. All these things make people feel their sense of autonomy frustrated. But in technology, we have found that we need uh, or we can break apart uh, designs with a bit more of detail. So we have these spheres of experience, we call them. So the first one adoption is our preconceptions about a technology even before we touch it. Sometimes I, uh, people buy a mobile, uh, an Apple mobile phone because they feel this is going to be very useful. I haven't used it, but they've heard from marketing, word of mouth, et cetera, that this, the Apple phone is very usable. I feel competent. I'm going to feel competent, right? So it's satisfying one psychological need. So marketers will use uh, these uh, things sometimes to convince people that they, it will satisfy the psychological needs. Parents, for example, might want to buy an iPhone over something else because it has better control over um, a platform to control the use of their children. So screen time features, they might feel correctly or not that the screen time features on the iPhone is better than that one. And they might we be willing to spend more money because the phone allows them to do that. But then on the phone, we have the interface. The interface refers to all the menu options. I can put more menu options uh, that allow me to personalize the phone in the ways I like. And that provides me a sense of autonomy at what we call the interface level. Tasks are the things that I sometimes I have to do in order to achieve something that is important to me. It's not necessarily what is important to me, it's indirectly related. For example, uh, I want to do more exercise, so I need to go to my app here that tells me how many steps I walked. It's not that I really care, the day 7,000 or 8,000. What I care about is the goal is really be more fit, lose weight, I don't know, something else. Right? It's not the steps themselves. Uh, the behavior is the thing that we do care about. 
It might be connecting to others, socializing, go out and do exercise and be more fit, et cetera. Life is a connection of all the behaviors that we engage on. And finally, society. So the yellow one is the, the ones that did involve direct stakeholders. And this one are the ones that uh, involve other people. So even if I decide not to use Twitter, Twitter will have an impact on me because other people do. Uh, for example, if misinformation is spread around, they will change their minds about their politics or whatever because they do use Twitter. So even if um, I don't use it, it will have an impact on, on, my, on me and the society around me. So these are the sort of questions we can quantify. A lot of my research is about uh, psychological evaluations, quantitative evaluations. So these are some of the questions in, that, that we use. This technology gives me freedom to use it in the way I want. That will be at the interface level. The, the one that might be more relevant now is this technology makes me lose confidence in my ability to engage in particular behavior, could be to um, learn math. Uh, and that's the, the behavior. Or when I th scroll through social media posts with this technology, it makes me feel excluded or isolated. When, so I, I picked up these two because this is about frustration of psychological needs. And the argument I want to make, uh, well, we have here, if you want to learn more about the models, the questions, et cetera, we have a couple of papers uh, on that I'm happy to circulate and it has all the questionnaires and, and we can look. One of the things I wanted to do today is learn more about, well, obviously meet the team, um, Manuela, uh, Caitlin, um, Christopher, et cetera, and Helen, and, um, that we had made online for, for quite a while, but also look at other possible connections. Like Christopher said, TUM and Imperial have strategic connections, so there are always opportunities for collaboration, share grants, and so forth. So you can always read this and, and look at the questionnaires. So now, Let me come here. I will very quickly skip. This is a debate about autonomy and environment, how we support autonomy in different environments. It's something that has been in psychology for ages. So there's a, a debate in the middle of the Cold War. And this is connected to my first slide, right? How politics comes into be, uh, behavioral science, if you want, and how we create environments. In the 60s, Carl Rogers, um, B.F. Skinner, who are maybe two of the most famous psychologists, one is the client center approach and the other one the behavioralist approach, were discussing about what is the impact of behavioral science on society and issues of ethics and, of course, politics. No? They were in the middle of the Cold War. And I think a lot of the things that were happening back then are happening again today, 50, 60 years later. We are in the middle of polarization, we, you could argue Cold War, uh, you, although in many places the Cold Wars are not cold, <laughs> they're hot, yeah? there's actual wars. And behavioral science has a very impact on that and technology design has a big impact on this. And I think that's why uh, regulators are so concerned and they bring things like the AI Act because at the bottom is this, it has to do a lot with the politics behind. Look forward to the chance of having an opportunity. Sorry, I had a, a, a little recording, but that will take too long. That, where they are talking about this, and it's beautiful also. It's a, I really recommend it if you're interested in these things. It's very long, but the, the way people debated in the 60s was fantastic. And the humor of, between two people that, in a way, are polar opposites, uh, beautiful. Anyway, back then, at the same time, Joseph Weizenbaum, that I think is maybe the first AI ethicist. He was the guy who wrote uh, um, the first chatbot, ChatGPT. This is the very, very, very origin, if you want, Eliza. And after he realized how people attributed human values to the chatbot, he started being very concerned and became an ethicist in a way. And he said that there were an important difference between deciding and deciding for him was a logical and computational activity. 
And this one could be programmed by uh, put into computers and it was okay. But there was a difference with choosing. Choosing was related to motivation. It was a product of human judgment, which may include things like emotions, compassion, and human values. This difference is very important. And what he uh, wanted to make clear is that he thought that choosing was something that should be left to humans, right? Not to machines. And this is at the core of many of the discussions today. So you, you read uh, uh, Elon Musk about, ooh, uh, this eliminates constraints humans growth or how Facebook manipulates emotions or more about emotions, emotional AR researchers. What, what happens when I, I knows you is AI for human empowerment. See, empowerment is a word that we constantly use. And empowerment, it's basically human autonomy. It's felt human autonomy. That's my view at least, right? I would love to hear yours on that. So measuring, being able to measure human autonomy goes to the core of things that we call human empowerment. And so in order to be able to state, to say AI is going to increase human empowerment, we need to measure it. I know if those designers are actually supporting that or frustrating, making it more difficult. Uh, and, and that's the core yesterday. This is from today's paper uh, about when it was approved. The AI Act, it's all about how do we make AI more, uh, allow for human empowerment and prevent it from uh, manipulating people. So that's why I say the elephant in the room for AI researchers, engineers, computer scientists, where I include myself. Like you saw a lot of my work on affective computing has to, was connected to, to this sort of thing. So is connected to this sort of thing. So the biggest challenge for AI researchers today is not to develop autonomous systems. It is to support human autonomy. I think this is something that engineers, computer scientists, we have not thought enough about. It's really, really important to realize this. And for that, we need to be able to obviously define human autonomy very well and work with psychologists, uh, et cetera. And here are the examples on um, the impact that it has on choosing. And these are different forms of manipulation that are used with technology. Coercion is when we make it impossible, deny uh, or impose conditions on, on the type of things that people can do. Deception, when, well, clickbait, but we are not going to get into this, but I can go back to this if you want. Uh, different ways of manipulating people with technology. So these are four approaches that I have taken. I just quickly will go over this uh, to manage values in my engineering projects. One is choosing the right project. Uh, and, and that often is not that, if, not, not that easy. Um, obviously, you can say, well, I'm not going to defense projects. Perfect. But uh, there are other projects that are much more difficult uh, than that. And, and they are getting harder. You know? I can give you some examples later. Uh, the second one is engaging with the community. So being part of like the global AI uh, community or um, uh, global AI ethics community that Christopher also uh, leads, um, and IEEE, um, who has created um, standards for AI ethics, etc. This is really important. Um, and, and there you can look at things like I said, human autonomy, do no harm. And, and harm, looking at the AI act, I think that what it's important is that besides supporting well-being, what legislators care is not about well-being so much because you can't ask a company to promote well-being. It's not part of their scope, if you want, their uh, obligations. But preventing psychological harm or physical harm it is an obligation. So the AI Act makes it very clear. This is a, from one of the articles that they approved yesterday, um, is that AI should not have or not produce psychological harm. And to me, that's connected to um, the psychological need frustration. There is tons of evidence uh, showing that people will not engage in any behavior. 
people are more likely to suffer mental illness uh, when their environments are too controlling. Um, well, one clear example, again, connected to the work that we've done with Christopher around COVID, the impact that COVID regulations have on limiting people's ability to move, etc., that will have an impact on mental health. I mean, and it's the limitation of uh, freedom that may have its value for public health has other consequences. And looking at the two consequences is important. Um, so looking at the psychological impact and psychological need frustration from the perspective of harm, it's very important. Uh, the law, as you probably would know much, much better than, than I do about the, the AI Act, um, but it's always about doing no harm. And there are some things that are prohibited. And now that includes things like affective computing, recognizing emotions, etc. High risk use may be permitted, but you have to be careful that it doesn't. And you will need to be able to show that you haven't produced harm. And uh, low or no risk are the ones that, but the majority of every AI application will be there. And it will have a huge impact. So we have here a list of the prohibited ones, a high risk and low risk. And um, the fines will be up to 6% of the global revenues of a company. So for Amazon, that will be uh, $7 billion. So huge fines if, you, if a company uh, is shown to produce harm. So I guess the one thing I wanted to put forward here uh, that's how I, I didn't talk too much about my individual projects, but here is this one, is that utilizing psychological need frustration, uh, these sort of questionnaires that we have developed as a potential way of uh, measuring psychological harm. Um, and this is, and there's ton of evidence. Uh, this is probably the self-determination theory is one of the most empirically supported theories out there in psychology. Um, in the last paper I was reading, there were set 70 meta-analyses. So a meta-analysis compounds, brings together many different psychological uh, studies, empirical studies, and showing the effect sizes in areas from health to education, to workplace design, uh, and so forth. Um, so environments, technological environments, including those that, that use AI, make it, that make it hard to satisfy these needs are producing harm. And finally, what we have been doing is uh, creating design processes that companies, uh, innovators can use that include ethics analysis in, in the process, no? not just well-being, but also looking at what potential impact it might have on ethics and, um, and values. So that, with that, I conclude, and I have a lot of time for questions and, and talking a little bit more about the project. This is part of my team. So I didn't have a photo with all of them, but I wanted just to be, I wanted to put it out to say thank you to my, to the team. Thank you very much for this fascinating lecture and insight into all that you are doing. Okay, so the floor is open. Uh, maybe I have your questions or comments. So, so I, uh, my question is about uh, effective computing and uh, the, the recent launch of this many new uh, setting and uh, wearable devices, especially with the vision pro by Apple. It really seems uh, the data that you can measure uh, by using consumer devices uh, and on individuals, it keeps keeps on it keeps on increasing by leaps and bounds, and a lot of it could be used for 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 uh, for effective measures. And at, at what point does a machine uh, reading uh, 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 how you behave or, or, or uh, 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 what you feel like your your, your your effective presence? At what point does it uh, become unethical? In spite of whether it's being used for harm or not, at, at, what, at what point? Uh, how do how would you uh, drive the border of, of, of privacy? So, 
you can look at it from two perspectives, and I think the two are equally valid. On the one hand, you can look at the software architecture that is very much driven by the business model of the provider. So the software architecture of Apple is around their business model that is mostly about, or has been until recently, about selling hardware. So the data in the system that you describe, <clears throat> it's encrypted locally and not even Apple can read it. Um, so you can give access of certain data that you decide which one to certain applications that you decide which one uh, to process the data and give you results about your own data. So that one is a very, I think, valid approach as if condition two uh, is respected. No? Uh, on the other hand, you have for condition one, let's call it, that is related to privacy, you will have other uh, platforms like Android that because the business model is about sharing advertisement, uh, don't encrypt the data, the data is stored in the cloud and can be used for other purposes. So when that happens, you are designing because it's software design. It's soft, that's where engineering and ethics come together to me. When you are designing a software platform, you are making those decisions that are very much about values. It's driven by your business model, but then you are implementing, you are hard coding a particular set of values. And that one, obviously, if your company is driven by advertisement, you want to understand if the person is thirsty, tired, anxious, right, uh, et cetera. You want to understand that, that's really useful. It can be, <laughs> thank you. Uh, so that's aspect one. The second one is what I'm saying here. I might not feel control. Christopher there might have felt control, might have felt that my statement was I want water, Christopher, <laughs> serve me water. He felt, he felt that, that I didn't tell him directly and I was giving him a, an insinuation like order and, and controlling his behavior. He might have annoyed this Raphael is like, why, why am I going to serve him water, right? If he feels, oh no, I empathize with him. He's been talking for half an hour and he might be thirsty. It's here, here's a bit of water. It's good for him. So the, the, the feelings, what people feel when they are it's engaging in this behavior is really, really important. We, it, now, going back to your questions, if the technology is supporting those psychological needs, I'm all for it. I think it's good. It's good for the individual. It's going to be good for the family, for society overall, etc. cetera. Uh, and these are, things that are not fictitious, they happen on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, so for example, I, I, like I said, I'm not talking about many of the pro, I didn't talk about specific projects today, but one of the large ones we have is with the Dementia Research Institute. It's one of the largest institutes on dementia in the UK. Uh, and I'm part of the Center for um, Technology and Development, uh, CRT. And, we have 120 houses that are instrumented with lots of sensors. That goes back to the project on smart homes. So these are smart homes and cities. This is smart homes, 120 people, families, generally, or couples. Some of them are actually, half of them are alone and half of them with people, um, with carers, uh, people who have dementia. Uh, and we have sensors in the doors, in the kitchen, in the bed, in the bathroom, everywhere you can imagine. Uh, and the idea there is to help them be independent for longer. That's a phrase that the government wants, and that's why they was in the grant call. That's what everybody is talking about citizen empowerment. You want the people to be able to live independently alone for as long as possible. Independently, empowerment. What is that saying? That's human autonomy. It's a felt experience of, yes, this technology is allowing me to be independent. But on the other hand, we're developing something that is as, surveil, as much surveillance as you can think of. You can literally not poo without us knowing. You cannot go to bed without us knowing, not knowing. You can't go out the house without 
as meaning not individual, obviously all of that is approved with a very complex ethics approval process and so forth. But the point is that all these smart homes, potentially there's somebody who knows everything about your life. What matters there is obviously that we look at, going back to your question, the two things are a platform that allows as much privacy as it's possible for that particular situation. But more importantly, is that the people there feel their psychological needs satisfied. A person with dementia and their carer, they feel more connected. They feel less fear that the, the person with dementia will just walk out and you will lose your wife to who knows what, right? That you feel that if there is an accident, there will be a response as quickly as possible. If, you're, if the person you care for is not drinking or uh, eating, you will find out. That can help to independence. But you need to understand the psychological impact. Uh, and that to me is a determining factor. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. so, so, so would any of these principles and, 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 and your answer, would any, would any of it will change if the entity on the other end that's analyzing the data is not uh, deterministic software or traditional machine learning, but instead it's generated AI that might have a mind of its own? <laughs> So far, nothing has a mind of its own, right? This is owned by Google. This one is OpenAI. This is Facebook. There will always be a company who is paying the power bill. So I think that's a very important aspect. Uh, engineers, sometimes we forget about, we say the algorithm, because obviously I can move my algorithm from this computer to this computer, but it always has an owner. Uh, no, and I don't mean owner in the intellectual property sense but there is something who is extracting value of that analysis. And those are humans that have their own values. So, so far, as far as I know, and I don't see in the foreseeable future, a computer running on its own. Somebody has to pay the bill for the power. So I, I mean, in the sense that, uh, so that, that, that language models, for instance, and especially that, 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 uh, where they're headed, that they seem to be headed, uh, that, that they're computing not just based on, on, on statistical, statistical analysis, but, but from a much, much uh, uh, wider range of, co of concepts and, 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 and objectives that they're given. Uh, they, they, it might be qualitatively different uh, than traditional software. So uh, we are doing a, a number of projects. On, I, I can go to the second one project on, uh, because it's relevant to this. Uh, we have a second completely different project around dementia. The first one is UK just like Germany, wealthy country, right? Uh, lots of money that we can put into people's houses with sensors and so on. The other one we have, it's in Peru, in four very small villages in Peru, in, one in the Amazon, uh, one on the coast, one in the Andes and Lima. So not small, Lima is huge, but the other one, and generally very low, it's a low and medium income country, and this is poor people within those places. So completely different context. So we have to build the technology. And this one, what we are thinking about, well, there are two. One is an app that it has a lot about, uh, I believe that some of you are what, working on citizen empowerment. So we have uh, a group of 100 healthcare workers that go and knock at doors. Uh, basically, these are people from the community and can do diagnosis of uh, dementia, et cetera. So they're involved in the community. Um, and they are doing this diagnosis and management of the illness and so forth. They are not doctors, but um, yeah, healthcare workers. Uh, and the the second technology is going to be a chatbot um, that supports people with the cares of people with dementia. And the chatbot also will track the economic impact, so doing a health economics aspect. So in that case. Um, we, we've been looking at using in that one, um, we have another project in on asthma. We are also using language models. And we were already doing in both cases chatbots, and now we have all ChatGPT, right? So what do we do? ChatGPT, you can't use it for health because you can't predict what the chatbot is going to say, kind of what you're saying. Um, but we're looking for ways of introducing safe approaches to that. Uh, and there are some ways. We, we haven't published them yet, but uh, we, we have made some progress in uh, very deterministic approaches to. Now, um, the question there is, 
what is ChatGPT doing? And to me, it's very much about culture. If you had a representation of culture with all its rights and all its wrongs, that's what we have there. So you can talk to culture, black box of culture. And that's why it's so controversial because culture defined by every single web page, every single thing that has been ever been written, etc., is something that some people don't want to hear. Some people, um, for good and bad reasons, is full of lies, right? All the dark aspects of society are there. Um, so, but you can customize that to a specific functions, no? And to know it better about asthma and, and make sure that it doesn't lie about asthma. No? I think that's the challenge. There was another question. That was it? No? Yeah. Okay. I have a question about human autonomy in algorithms and particularly how you can actually implement that in, into the algorithm. I like your comparison in the beginning when you said, when we use a smartphone, we can control with these uh, kind of switching it on and off how, how much uh, notifications we want and also how that kind of triggers the autonomy of persons because they can yeah themselves decide what they want to see and what they not want to see. Is that a concept that you think would make sense in algorithms as well, that you, for example, give the options to the user to say, I don't know, use this specific feature or not or something like that? And would you think with these kind of yeah, approach that would trigger human autonomy as well. And they think that they actually can control the outcomes of the algorithm or not, or what other kinds of yeah, ideas would you have regarding that? Excellent question. Uh, and I think in this, this is something that I, I think a little bit different to the AI, AI act the way I understand it. And uh, I'm sure here there are many more experts. And this uh, looks at AI as a general thing. I think it's, it's always good to look at the particular use case. Right, not be too general. You need to be very specific. Uh, so if you take a project that it's on um, uh, mis managing misinformation and building algorithms for filtering uh, misleading content, etc., that has to do with freedom of expression versus freedom to be offended of to not be offended. Um, that's one thing. Uh, and if you're talking, for example, in dementia, I can give you an example that will be a kettle. So why do we drink tea? Mm -hmm. huh? We don't. <laughs> oh, you don't. Yeah, <laughs> you don't. Why do you drink beer? Why do you drink beer? Right. So there are many motivations for drinking beer. Um, if you are uh, one of the older people that we're working with, uh, you are, you're going to ask them and they might feel it's the social aspect. Mm -hmm. I want to have a beer with Christopher because I want to be tipsy, I want to relax, adapt my mood. Or no, I want it because I want to socialize and feel the connection to him, right? Now, if I'm a person, an older adult uh, who uh, um, I'm frail, I cannot pick up one of those one liter jars that you guys drink. It's heavy, just a glass and the one liter of beer. I just can't, no? because I will spill it, it will produce a mess, etc. So what do I do? Well, you can give me other options where I can satisfy my behavior. If my attitude is that I want to um, socialize with Christopher, oh, just drink a small glass, right? That you can pick up, that is lighter, that has, um, that's one approach. It's allowing me to do what I want to do. Um, the technology in that case, the glass is designed to allow me to do that without harming me. Well, the kettle example I was going to use is that you can design a kettle that you have to lift or it could be a tap that gives you boiling water. Right? One um, doesn't allow if what you want to go is through the process of making the tea with a kettle, etc. you can't. But, uh, and if uh, in the case of getting drunk, maybe the, the small glass will not help me, will be limiting my freedom to get drunk. But if I want to socialize with him, it's okay. So it depends what the person wants to achieve, right? 
Um, and that's why understanding the, the experience of the person is important. In a recommendation system, if you give the wrong options to the person, and sometimes they, we call it choice, choice architecture. If you define, if you do your choice architecture in a way that feels controlling, there you are. It feels controlling. You're con trying to control me. I'm frustrated. You're giving me a technology that says you can do A, 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 or A, mm -hmm. right? Or with little variations. No, no, I want to do B. <coughs> and this, uh, yeah, a, a recommendation systems are very common. Very interesting. And just let me add, I, I sympathize very much with what you've said about the uh, thing um, that should AI be regulated on a general level or rather on a specific level? And I, I'm very much in favor of a specific level, actually. We, we had in Germany, for example, two years ago, the German AI Act on Autonomous Driving, uh, which I think was a good, good thing. It, uh, it, it concentrated specifically on this area. And, and about the EU AI Act, okay, it's, it's there now. The regulation process is not, not finished yet, but, but it's, it looks at it in a, in a very general sense. And I would say it's, it's open what effect it will have eventually. Uh, by the way, do you, are you aware of, of what the UK will do as, as a response to that? My understanding is more, much more industry-based. Mm -hmm. Potentially it's because they don't want to involve, get involved and politically just will be too messy. So they, the government is not just putting a one set of legislation, it's leaving it to each industry mm. to have legislation that are very specific. So that's what I understood as well, yeah. But yes. Um, first of all, a comment. I don't think you can regulate something like culture that we put in chat GPT. You can't regulate it like in specific levels. Mm. I mean, I guess we need general regulation, I guess. But when we think about like AI Act, my question is like, do you think if this bottom down, uh, this top down approach helps in regulating like what is happening in this, in this field in the society, or should we like develop a kind of bottom up kind of solution like regulation to this problem? Because now we are trying to regulate like this whole thing, like it's, Let's say open AI. I would say AI Act is a response to open AI, like my personal opinion. No, but and it was there much before. I mean, it was much earlier on. So yeah, to... But I mean, now, like what is happening, like the incentives are kind of driven by chat kind of I don't know, platforms, like the current incentives. And my, my question is, like, do you think that it, if it helps, like in regulating what they want to regulate, what we want to regulate, without having economical kind of like, side effects to the companies and to the kind of yeah economies in Europe. And the second question is like, is there like a bottom up approach kind of to control what is happening in AI field? Okay, so for the first one, uh, I think it goes back to the previous point. I, I think regulating open AI is very hard. And the, the fear I have is that if it's very, and specific, what will happen is that nobody will ever get sued. So it really backfires. You want to be as specific as possible. So when you go to court, you say, yeah, here's the harm. Because you can only legislate for harm. If it's not harming anyone, you can't tell a company that that's wrong to do. I mean, uh, legislation law is generally because you did something that is harming people. That I, I'm not a legal scholar, no, but is that fair enough? I think they will find ways of, of speci specifying that, um, I, I think, at least in Germany. I, I'm sure they will. <laughs> yeah, okay. So uh, and my understanding is generally what makes it easy to sue someone is like, you produce this harm to me. It could be a psychological harm. It could be a reputational harm. It could be a physical harm, uh, an economic harm, but there has to be a harm. And a harm that is very unspecific. You, yeah, I, I, I don't know how. So if it becomes ineffective, it's just never going to happen. That's, that's a fear I have. I think it's very important to be able to have that. And I think to the, your second question, yeah, bottom up, where people like us get involved, I think academics is very important because we are not either regulators or the people who are invested in the company, right? So it's important to have that kind of outside perspective that it's 
uh, an empirical, so we, we can collect empirical scientific evidence, we can try to find, explain, develop theories that predict certain things that will happen so you can prevent them rather than addressing the, the negative impacts post facto. What I would like to say from many um, conversations that I had or we had um, in the past month uh, is that uh, most of the other international players have explicitly said they will not go this way. There is no controversy about that we need rules for, for the technology and, and some kind of rules, but what type of rules and on what level that, and it's more, to be more specific or more general, should it be binding or non-binding? Japanese government, uh, we had a, a conversation with them, uh, with a representative from them, they said explicitly they will not go the way of binding rules. So they will have non-binding rules, they're aware of, of AI or responsible AI, trustworthy AI and everything, but they will go this way. And the US, uh, as it looks, will also go this way. And uh, and then, then there's the question, how will this affect Euro Europe, or specifically the EU? Will that be uh, a source of more innovation or rather not? And I think that that's the key question, ultimately. Where will, where will this go? Yeah. So uh, EU Parliament thinks it will trigger more innovation, but others do not. And German uh, Mittelstand, uh, small and medium companies, are rather skeptical about that, I have to say. So, but we will see. <laughs> and I think it's interesting because uh, the different solutions or approaches to regulation come also from a cultural perspective. I think, uh, you know, the way that the EU is addressing this in a, it's in a very, it's a very European way, right? That it would be very different to the American way or the Chinese way or English way. Although English, <laughs> Europe, yeah, that, that's... That's a wrong statement. It didn't come all right, but like English, yeah. because they ended up separate, but I think in many ways would have been, well, it's maybe somewhere between the US and, and they wanted to move towards more the US. Well, they were more, that's a different hopefully, issue, very complicated. Hopefully stuff. it doesn't end up like we are the odd ones out. Uh, so, uh, okay, any more questions? Yes. One of the topics which uh, differentiates us from uh, machines and AI. And uh, I'm sure you, you know about the Paul Ekman and facial uh, coding system. So, um, my question is uh, should there be some kind of privacy border when it comes to facial expression? Because of autonomy. So, it, I guess the answer would be similar to the one about the physiological signals, behavioral signals on your phone. Um, technology that helps you recognize, uh, there are two aspects. One is that the Ekman work has been found to be very of very little use in practical context. So we, we have some publications on that and not emotions that you often use in your human computer interactions. And second, there are some methodological concerns about the approach that Eggman used. But that work, in a way, it's very similar to what every effective computing project does. Uh, for example, recognizing emotions from voice in call centers, when the person is angry, when the person... Now, in the case of a system that recognizes emotions when you're talking to a call center operator. So I'm, I'm talking here, I'm calling, and Chris picks up the phone on the other side, somewhere else in the world, and then complaining about like a bill. Oh, the bill from my hotel was blah, blah, blah. I should have been half because, uh, and they notice I'm relaxed or, or the, um, he notices that uh, I'm, I'm taking it slowly, but then he says something that makes me really angry, right? So he could redirect me to someone else, to a third party, or the computer can detect my emotion and connect me to a supervisor. Uh, that might, he might not be happy because he doesn't want me to talk to a supervisor, but maybe I am. And that's where the, the, uh, you have to look at all the stakeholders, right? Because his rights should be as, as good as mine, as a customer. So you have to look at all the stakeholders. 
So the, we do a lot of this in value sensitive design, it's called approaches that, that we teach our design engineering students where in a particular problem like the, the, one on effect, the ones that appear on effective computing. And again, you have to be very specific to a specific use case, because if not, if you don't understand who are the stakeholders and what are the values that come in play, you can make a, a, a real ethical statement. So here, the, the call center, I can see immediately at least two, three stakeholders, two direct ones, because we're engaging with the technology, and a third one that will be the company. Uh, and then you have to make a, an ethical call on that. I think disclosure, uh, and we have been writing about this, um, disclosure is important, and then consent. So you have to tell the person that there is, the, the, the conversation might be recorded, that they always do that when you call the call center, and second, that it might be big process and supported with AI. Right? That's the sort of things that we could do. And then do you agree? Yes. And maybe the person should be able to choose with a system because it might be giving them benefits uh, and of course, there will be enterprise issues because he, as an employee, might say no. Although call center operatives mm -hmm. probably don't have much uh, union support. Uh, I don't know if they're unionized or not. I have no idea about a customer service, but uh, probably depends on the country. But that sort of things will be, he will be negotiating issues about the or maybe the system is customized so it can recognize my emotions, but not the customers, but not his. You know, those are things that would be negotiated and signed on contract. Uh, uh, this is similar to the case that you might have read where Facebook or social media posts are being processed uh, by humans, similar to, and actually economically will possibly be similar to the customer service operatives. Uh, and they are having to look at porn and violence and you know things like that and it has a psychological impact on them and what do we do so there are ethical issues there can you use effective computing to recognize or other computer vision approaches to recognize that automatically it's already done uh, and that reduces the the weight on, on on people that are processing that so you have to look at the very specific cases right i, I feel uh, in some cases, there are values uh, for every stakeholder involved, and some cases, no, and you have to negotiate those things. Yeah. More questions? Follow up? <laughs> no. Yeah, Hello. 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 Um, yes and no. Uh, so the, the answer is a little bit complex. So the discipline, or if you want, self-determination theory has been uh, used for decades, right? And in, in that literature, there's a lot of longitudinal studies. Uh, they're not all about, or, or very few are about technological issues, but there are longitudinal studies about the impact of parenting approaches, for example. Uh, how a controlling voice or controlling attitudes of parenting or over parenting, sometimes they call it, what is the impact on children? There's uh, longitudinal studies about uh, schooling or workplaces. So in those cases, there are many longitudinal studies. Um, in technology design, sometimes it's very difficult because the way uh, you will manage cohorts, if, especially if you're not a technology company, a technology company could do it easily. Um, but we are trying to, um, and we have done, things are not exactly the same with SET, but on mental health, where we look at longitudinal studies and the impact of a particular intervention that had to do with things related to SDT over time. So we develop a, a mental health app um, and we had a very large sample, I think it was 4,000 people use it for um, 30 days for a month. 
And then we did have follow-ups. So besides the time they use the app, we had uh, three months and six months follow-up to measure the impact on psychological health of those people to evaluate, for example, if the app was able to reduce the risk of anxiety and depression, not just reduce symptoms, but reduce the risk. I was wondering whether this also goes in the direction of matching with this kind of uh, frustration. Because, uh, for example, the case of the apps that uh, lead you to do more exercise, if you keep getting these notifications that, oh, you should do more exercise, you should do more exercise, um, whether it is uh, sort of leads you to also um, change your behavior or your behavior goals in the longer term. Yeah, so uh, if that fantastic debate between Carl Rogers and B.F. Skinner touches on that particular, because that's behavioral science, right? So you have nudging that comes from behavioral scientists, psychologists, and economists. And B.F. Skinner finishes with a statement saying, if behavioral science allows us to predict the impact of an intervention, it allows us to plan the society we build. So shouldn't we build the society we want? And I find that a statement really interesting because it tells you a lot about that attitude on, on of some behavioral scientists. Right? In a, uh, my perspective, is very colonial. What we want, the society we want, is generally a very particular group of people and a particular country. It doesn't tell you about the different values that different people have. So the approach of nudging contains uh, uh, implicitly a lot of values. You know? They are implemented in that choice architecture, you might. Um, I'm not saying it's not useful. You do want people to do more exercise, right? Um, but you have to do it in the ethical way. <laughs> Yes, exactly. To me, that's at the bottom line, no? like trying to help people with things that are essential to them, not to the government that create the nudging approach or the company, because nudging for the government is called nudging and, and you have, you know, um, particular businesses that do that for the government. Um, but on the other hand, you also have, it's called marketing, the same thing, it's called marketing. And, and it has completely opposite impact. Can I switch to the slide with the discussion? Which one? Uh, the discussion between these two. Oh, yes. Therefore, maybe on YouTube I can find it. It's really funny. It's on YouTube. I don't know that. So. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's on YouTube and it's really funny because it was tape recorded. It's like four hour session. So um, in the sixties, obviously, we, they, and they will have to turn the tape. So it said, turn tape to the other side. So uh, you, most of you are too young to to have ever used a tape. So uh, is, is that already the, the small tapes or is it these big uh, the big old tapes maybe? In no, the because it's uh, I don't know because now it's on YouTube. But uh, the, I think it's too early for the small tapes. It's even the earlier. Yeah, maybe you're process. right. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, exactly that one. What what is it called? Just the tape. My my I remember my. Yeah, and my father had them. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, so that was your question. And then um, yeah yeah I, I we can take one more. Okay, one more question. I had a question yeah. it went in the same direction uh, concerning the longitudinal study. So, yeah. But I actually, uh, maybe later, when we can talk a little bit. I'm also working at the EAI, and uh, currently we're working on a project uh, on AI enabled decision support systems and the influence on ethical decision making. And then we actually also talk about how the, it how different systems, the ones that are outcome oriented and the others that are process oriented, the ones help to make ethical decision, decisions oneself and the other ones direct towards a particular ethical decision. And yeah. It's happy to talk. Yeah. A, a yeah. links to what you so, uh, said. So. Yeah, I'm having lunch uh, now, but then I'm happy to, to come over. Um, just a couple more meetings. So, yeah.
So thank you very much, Raphael, for accepting our invitation and um, for your fascinating talk. All of you, thank you very much for joining us and contributing to the discussion. Uh, it's a pity that we couldn't meet all of your team, uh, including the one at the bottom right. Uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, but uh, hopefully there will, there will be an event maybe in London next time, sometime. Mm -hmm. Um, so, and um, thank you very much for the Tomb thing. Thank for your hospitality here. Um, stay uh, all tuned for an exciting year to come because this is not the, this is the last Tomb speaker series for this semester, but we still have an event on July 18th with the topic AI and human rights. It's a, it's a panel discussion. Uh, and we uh, later this year in September, we have our second responsible AI forum taking place also again, oh, finally in person now this time uh, from 13th to 15th September in the main building of, um, of TUM. And for more, the registration will be open in July. For more information about these and other events, check our webpage, follow us on LinkedIn and Twitter. Thank you very much, Raphael. Thank you.